She's an All-American swimmer, part of the Cal Hall of Fame, a world record holder, and she's a gold medal winner. She's Stacyana Winfield, and she joins us now on episode 37 of the Masters in Coaching podcast. Let's go! Well, welcome into episode number 37 of the Masters in Coaching podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching it on YouTube, wherever you get these podcasts or are watching. We appreciate it. Thousands upon thousands are watching and listening to this podcast. We thank you so much for doing that. We are excited about our guest this week. Uh, she is an Olympic gold medalist. Uh, she's a world record holder. Uh, she's in the Hall of Fame at Cal Berkeley where she set school records and it was an all American swimmer. Uh, she's a teacher. Um, she's a yoga yogi, I guess is what we call it as a, a yoga fanatic. Uh, she's a founder of the Swim It Forward Foundation and she is Stacia Winfield. How you doing? Great. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. I guess it never gets old when somebody says you're an Olympic gold medalist. I, it's, I'm honored and humbled to be able to, to say, yes, I am. <laughs> how, how much is swimming still a part of your life? I mean, to be an Olympian, you start at a young age, you work hard. I mean, God knows the training that goes in, the dedication uh, to get to the Olympics, let alone win at the Olympics. But then afterwards, where, where are you now as far as uh, your involvement with swimming? Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to leave it. I think, you know, it's your identity for so long. Um, but also I realized that, you know, like God gave me this gift, right. To, to learn swimming. And I had the best mentors as coaches. Um, and right when I, I basically was kind of done, um, with my own career, I was fortunate enough to be able to assist a head coach in a developmental program, um, Irvine Novas and Andy Kawamato Platt. She was like, the best mentor of how to coach, right? Cause you can swim well and really not know how to coach it. So, um, I had about a, a year mentorship with her just learning how to coach developmental swimming. And it was amazing. I remember going back actually, uh, a year later, I started to just do like training on my own and trying to go a little bit, you know, just some pro meets. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I understand it so much better. <laughs> you know? like, I've had to verbalize teaching it now for a while. Um, and I, I, it's hard to leave the sport, you know, even though I'm not competing anymore. I mean, that's so many hours to grind and I just, you know, don't have the time in my day to do it. But um, I'm really fortunate and grateful that I can use the things, you know, that I've learned and um, be able to guide and mentor young swimmers. It's been a blast. So I'm coaching now. Um, I work at St. Margaret's. Episcopal school in San Juan and I'm coaching um, their high school swim team we're in season so it's a busy busy time but um, they're amazing and we have a ton of fun and um, you know the winning is second to just enjoying the journey of that. So you've been coaching post Olympic career for 20 plus years college high school and teaching as well middle school high school level uh, is that a, something you thought you would be doing with your life is teaching being a leader and getting back into education. Um, my parents are teachers, so I think okay. it, you know, it's kind of inherent in my makeup as a person, um, yeah. you know, just that, that sense of guiding. And I think teaching and coaching kind of go hand in hand. Um, so it, I've enjoyed it so much. I think I've been really blessed with the fact that I was able to teach PE and health and wellness. And again, these, these um, things in my, in my wheelhouse that I'm really comfortable sharing with the kids. And I think when you're passionate and, um, enthusiastic about those ideas the kids absorb it right so it's been a lot of fun to just push them in different ways and and get them to try things that maybe they never tried before and because you know it not everyone can swim right so let's do it holistically and see where it goes with whoever and just love moving right talk we'll talk a little bit about that because your teaching is not just hey let's go out there we're going to play paddle tennis or we're going to go out there and play flag football uh you get yoga involved you get breathing involved and your curriculum is different and it's been very successful talk a little bit about that yeah thanks um first off i had to figure out how to teach flag football <laughs> which was great in itself uh <laughs> um, it was a challenge but you know we had fun we messed up more than than we did well but that's okay um you know it's it's one of those things i I know not every kid is going to be a superstar athlete and not a, some kids don't like moving at all. Right. And to me, that's so sad. Like I just, I love moving. I love, um, and competing was second to that. Right. I just wanted to be in the pool and swim. Um, and I think you get the best like social aspects of, you know, that. And so 
I've had a challenge at first to teach students that weren't really interested in um, sports or moving or competing. And um, I had a couple of co-teachers that we just collaborated and said, what are we going to do for these kids? You know, and so um, I've done yoga for 20 years and, you know, with swimming inherently, there's a lot of breath work anyways um, and mindfulness. And I, I was really grateful my school kind of funded this idea of going to um, get certified with mindfulness. Um, and then I just am this like lifelong learner. So I always, I'm looking for things that are going to make my day better. Right. And then in tune, share that with the students. And so I would kind of just try it out, you know, and it's taken, it's like the sixth year in, I started it with like the third, fourth, fifth graders. And I was teaching them, you know, basics of yoga, basics of breathing. And there was a little bit of pushback at first from the kids, you know, like, what is this? My mom does this. I don't really know, you know, but, um, the coolest part was when they lay down in Savasana and the first time, cause our kids are never still right. They're never still. Um, there's just so much stimulus all the time coming at us. And, um, for them to experience the peace of laying down in Svasana and just breathing. And um, I did it yesterday with my eighth grade group and they're a hard group. There's 56 kids in this weight room class and they're amazing. They're my favorite group, but they're the hardest group. And two of them who have had my, you know, um, just have a close relationship with them. They're like, can we do Savasana today? <laughs> <laughs> sure. We're going to throw it in at the end, you know, so you take 10 minutes and they lay down and they don't move. And I always direct the class because a lot of them don't know me. This it's like a new group. And I just said, you know, this is the only space where your teacher's going to tell you to do nothing and <laughs> enjoy it, you know, and it's pretty cool because they just absorb that and they, they do, they've gotten really good at laying still and kind of stilling their mind and, and then finding that peace. And the coolest part, I'll just throw it in. It's the most gratitude I receive from the students when we really? do it. And I would love to like, write a research paper and data on it because I swear they leave after that moment of quietness and they thank me and it's the I mean I guess sometimes you know you get thank yous right not a lot but yeah. genuinely thank me and it's like wow you know that was thank you thank you for allowing that space to just you know be relaxed well I think you hit it on the head I mean kids nowadays quiet time uh being alone in your thoughts I mean sometimes it's a negative thing but it's also it's like well I, I gotta be do something all the time I got three girls and I gotta be on my phone I gotta do this I gotta do that I gotta be snapchatting somebody or whatever but to just be quiet these kids don't understand that I think for them a lot of it's like a frightening thought but then after you get over that it's like hey this is very peaceful I don't have to worry about anything going on right now yeah absolutely uh talk a little bit about what leaders in your life and, and people that have helped you along the way, not only during the swimming part, uh, but post swimming and, and getting into being a teacher and a leader yourself. Um, do you go back and look at different people along the way in different parts of your life that have helped kind of get you and mold you to who you are now and, and molding young kids? Yeah. Um, I have to first give a shout out to my dad. I think he taught me from the very beginning that I needed to be my own master and He's very well read. He, um, you know, gave me all the books and all the knowledge. And I said, you know, you, you're going to have the best coaches. You're going to have terrible coaches. You're the one that knows yourself the best. And you're going to have to take everything that works and throw away the rest. Um, and he's a lifelong learner. And I think he passed that down to me where I'm constantly searching for leadership and a mentor. Um, and what can I learn? What can I take away? What can I learn not to do? Right. Cause you get shown both and, I'm really grateful for that. I think my coaches uh, in my swimming career were amazing leaders in the sense that they were passionate about what they did. And then they were also passionate about guiding me and the people that they coached to just be good people, right? And, and that was kind of a testament to who they were as people. Um, and I, I really uh, absorbed that as, you know, as student athlete, it was like, well, okay, this, this is the biggest part of my life and I'm spending the most time with these people, but they actually care about me right? And not just swimming. Um, and so I really tried to take that on in my own leadership um, with the students is, you know, ask them how about their day, ask them what they did the weekend, you know, whatever, just get into what they're engaged with, where they are in the moment. And it's, it's interesting what you hear, you know, and they feel connected to you because I do sincerely care, right? And I have, you know, 400 plus students, so I can't, um, yeah, I would take all day, right? Just having those conversations, but little moments, um, I think of connection with those kids is really important to lead them and guide them and, and just lead by example, right? So, yeah. um, you know, just that's the best leadership, I think, is just doing the right thing at the right time, you know? 
it, it's interesting because I mentioned I got three daughters and I feel like especially during COVID and now post COVID, uh, one's in college now, one's in high school, one's in middle school. They're they're all looking for leaders in their lives, you know, outside of mom and dad. They go to school, their coaches, their teachers, uh, faculty members, somebody. Uh, they, they're I think truly more than ever right now, kids. Uh, teenagers are looking for leaders, looking for people to kind of help them get through this craziness right now. And I think it's it's something that I think educators need to realize, especially more now than ever, is that this is a time that we need leaders in these young kids' lives. Yeah, and I it's interesting because you know the, the idea of leadership, right, and teaching leadership, you know, you need leaders and you need people that are willing to follow, right? Yeah. And and that's not always in the same moment, the same person. Um, and there's going to be moments where you lead and there's moments where you follow. Right. And so um, I've learned that lesson as well. Like it's, it is important to develop leaders. Right. And we talk about that at our school a lot. Um, and then what, what that means to lead, like what the responsibility is to lead, you know, and the courage and, you know, I, I listen more than I talk, you know, and you wouldn't know it on this podcast because I'm super chatty, but um, I, I try and listen more than I talk. And if you really listen um, you end up hearing things that you need to hear, right? And you miss it otherwise. Um, and I think that building those connections with people is, is the best way to lead because you gain trust um, and you gain a friendship and then you can figure out how you can serve them, right? Yeah, no doubt about it. I'll, we'll get, we're going to get back to leadership in, in a second, but I want to go back to swimming because uh, about 10 years ago, I had a chance to work with Amy Van Dyken, the former swimmer, for about a year and a half and she was getting into doing, starting her media career um post swimming and and she talked about the competitiveness of swimming and not only getting to the olympics but at the olympics not just the competition uh amongst countries but amongst teammates and amongst being on relays and just the competitiveness behind the scenes it blew my mind to be honest with you to 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 hear that because you think the road getting to the olympics is one thing but once you're there you're competing and you're all on the same team but it's interesting to see here how com the world of swimming in the individual sport is so competitive. And I guess at times, I guess everything is very political as well. Yeah. It blew my mind. It's interesting because swimming uh, should it be right. And I grew up knowing that, you know, it's time-based and you, you're the fastest you win. Right. Um, yeah. We did experience political um, uh, events, you know, on the relays and things in, in the Olympics together. I was on the team with her in 2000. So I pretty much know what she's talking about. And it was a hard realization to, to, to understand and experience like, wow, you know, there's people are vying for spots and it, maybe it's not based on time, right? And right. that was my first experience with politics and, you know, lobbying. And it was just like, oh, this is a mess. You know, I just want to, I just want to swim fast. Right. Um, but learning how to, to kind of navigate that, right? And this maturity level, I think at 40, I'm like, oh, I got this all day, you know, but, <laughs> but at 19, 20, it was, it was shocking, you know? And I'm grateful that it normally is time-based because it's hard to, most sports aren't, right? A coach is, is deciding your future or right. a judge or, you know, and so um, that was one of the beauties of swimming for me. All right. For those who, this is a, a, a visual and an audio podcast. You can watch on YouTube. You can listen to iHeartRadio app or wherever you download your podcast. We appreciate listening here to the episode 37 of the Masters in Coaching podcast. For those who are watching right now, they see you got the bald head, alopecia at a young age. Uh, talk a little bit about that early on, how you dealt with it and how it has helped you or, or molded you to be the leader that you are now, you know, and, and maybe it's morphed a little bit. Maybe it was anger. Maybe it was different forms of emotions over your life, but to where you are now leading kids. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it happened when I was 12. I lost my hair when I was 12 and it, it came up pretty fast mm -hmm. and, um, so scared, right. And very angry and very sad. And, um, just prayed for it to come back for about a year, uh, but I kept swimming and I didn't wear wigs and I, at the pool, it was just like the place that I needed to be because it felt safe. Yeah. My friends figured it out. I talked to them about it. No big deal. And I forgot to be honest, you know, and I'd walk by a, a window and be like, Oh, I don't have hair. You know, <laughs> you don't see yourself all the time. Um, I think it also allowed me as I started to gain strength in swimming and a little bit more status. Um, I was the story. Right. And my coach, Dave Salo, was so great about just telling me, like, lean into that, you know, because I was pretty afraid. And he was yeah. like, no, like, you need to talk about it. You need to get out there. You need to be a role model. And he pushed me when I wasn't ready to go yet, right, to do that. And I'm grateful for that because 
the moment I did, again, I, I, I made these connections with people that were either going through it or had a child that was going through it. And it was developed that, that idea of like, you got this, you know, like we're in this together. I'm, I'm just leading by example. I'm inspiring others. And that was, um, uh, I just such an honor to carry at a young age, you know, 1920, you don't necessarily feel like you're ready for that. Right. But, um, it was really special. And then now because of it, I think the more that I grew, like I went to Berkeley because it, I felt the safest there, right? It was this okay. area where everyone looks different, right? Everyone at all is accepted. Sure. Um, and so that was really uh, kind of a, a place for me to grow and develop my own identity. Um, and I think swimming, like I've always, I've always, I always had swimming and, and my body and, and I, that was my femininity, right? And it's hard when you don't have hair sometimes right and I'm a PE teacher and I'm very aggressive like I you know I'm competitive so like in terms of um you know gender characteristics I can sometimes be taken for a man right and so I have to do things to make myself feel more feminine and whatever and um, I know even, that's kind of how I started yoga too it was like well I want I want this I want to feel good I want I want my body to feel good and because when I radiate that it doesn't matter if I have hair or not right then people just start to see me um, and that was a really great lesson to learn at a young age because it was hard to go through it for sure. You, you, you keep referencing yoga and I, I work with somebody who does yoga five days a week and swears by it and loves it for all aspects of it because it's that his quiet time away from his family, but at the same time, his opportunity to at the, in his mid forties uh, to get into shape and stay in shape at this time. But it, you, you hear about yoga and we talked a little bit about it, the, the mental part of it um and the physical part of it is is truly amazing i think a lot of people now are, are seeing what yoga is doing it but it's it's it, it, you're our first guest here we're episode 37 who's really talked about yoga and what it could do to the mind and body it's interesting we've talked about we talked to soccer coaches and we talked to basketball coaches but nobody's brought up yoga yet you know it it's interesting because i think as we age right certain um certain exercises are harder and harder to do on our bodies and um, every, I think just exercising in general helps circulation, which, you know, the better you're circulating, the younger you feel, the younger you look, right? Like that's just kind of the aging process. Um, and so for me doing the yoga, it was like, wow, this is like the golden nugget of feeling young and not hurting my body. Right. And then the physical characteristics of that was amazing. And then top it off with the mental side of it. It's like, man, I'm getting more out of this mentally than physically, you know, where I feel like I've been to the spa when I leave, you know? And so it was just, it's just nice. It's one of those things that I can do, I think my whole life um, more so than I'm swimming you can as well, right? There's no gravity, but um, I don't get the same, um, the, I get the mental side of swimming, like being in the water, yeah. but I don't, I'm hungry. I, I don't, you know, I just want to eat after I swim. So there's not this feeling of like, I'd have to swim for three hours to get the same 45 minute yoga class, you know, it just doesn't <laughs> compute, so. Yeah, it's it's for me. It's it's just a fun way to to stay in shape and feel good. I want to get back to swimming really quick, and then we're gonna we're gonna get into your involvement with Concordia and the fact that you went through the master's program um, and and now I'm gonna go back and teach, which is awesome. I'm gonna be a keynote speaker at the conference coming up in June. But I, I want to ask you quickly because you're an Olympic gold medalist, and I'm curious because the Olympics and swimming in particular. How, is there a way we can get track and field and swimming to be sports again that are popular? It, it, it may be like basketball, football, baseball, all the time, rather than every four years in the summer where we're mesmerized by the two weeks of the Olympics and find out stories like yourself and, and other Olympians and falling in love with the Olympians and rooting for them for two weeks. But after that, it's like the, the sport, I think, for most people it kind of just goes away and then every, four years later it's back the same with the, the winter olympics but how is there something we can do is there is is there anything possible to get swimming track and fields the, the individual sports like that more attention every besides every four years you know it's interesting um the international swim league was started a few years back and i don't know if you've heard about it with the isl and it's this idea of this professional swim league right where the format's a lot different than normal swim competitions. They're dual meets against each other and all these teams have been developed with professional swimmers. Okay, okay. And they're really trying their best to gain traction, you know, and to make this a kind of an event, a fun thing to watch and yeah, see. Yeah. And I think the hard part is that if you don't, if you haven't swam, 
sometimes swimming can seem boring, right? And I hate saying that because I, I love swimming, but I, I, it's true, I think, for a lot of people, if they don't understand it, and it's just like, I'm just swimming back and forth, like, I don't get it, right? But that idea of competition and head-to-head, -head and um, the Olympics does such a great job of, of highlighting those stories, right? And that's what people attach to. Um, so I think bringing in that human connection, right? And as it's, as it's aired and taped and you can watch it, I think might be more helpful, right? But I just, I just don't know. It, it's, it's a hard sport to sell, yeah. you know? And it's a hard sport to fund. Like advertisers don't necessarily want to get involved because they're not going to get the money in return, right? So it's, it's just an interesting dynamic. With, with that being said, when you're going through the Olympics, and I, I'm, I, I'm going off of course here a little bit. I think this is, I'm so honored to talk to you about this. Um, with that being said, as an Olympian, when you're going through the process, when you're 19, 20 years old, do you realize the two week window you have or that the, the summer window you have to, to capture America's hearts, to, to go for gold, but not only that, you know, become a household name across America and have people rooting for you every night as they sit around their television and watch it. Do you realize that at the time or is it maybe years down the road where you're watching and realizing what what captivates people for that summer of the Olympics? Yeah, you know, that, that's hard. Um, I feel like, speaking of my own experience, when I was 19 and I made it, all I wanted to do was to compete at the highest level and to reach my own potential, right? And I, I didn't have dreams of being on a cereal box or like, it just, it wasn't about that for me. It was, it was more of like, how can I be my best, right? And push myself to be my best. Um, and I think when you start to get involved in the other side of it, the monetary side, um, a lot of times it just becomes a job and you lose that passion for um, the sport, right? And the event. And I mean, I got to the Olympics and I was blown away. Like it, I was just, all I wanted to do is celebrate, right? Like I was like the kid in the candy shop, like, oh my gosh, like there's the Williams sisters, you know, there. and it was just like, for me, it was, it was the experience, yeah. you know, um, and the money, I, it, it just, it didn't drive me. Um, and I've, I've seen some people be really successful. Right. And, and, um, and have that opportunity to monetize, you know, their abilities. Um, I unfortunately wasn't ever really there, you know, but, um, I think it's okay. I think I, I got a lot out of it. That wasn't, you know, for that, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let's get back to current day um, teaching, coaching. Uh, you went back, though, even though you got your degree from Cal Berkeley and, and later on in your life, you go back and you pursue a master's degree. Concordia University provides master's in coaching and athletics administration program. Uh, you write a thesis about swimming. And now you're coming back this summer, which is really cool to teach courses uh, beginning this summer, 2022. You're going to be a keynote speaker coming up in June at the big uh, California Coaches Conference. Talk a little bit about why at that point in your life did you want to go back and get your, your master's and, and why Concordia? Um, you know, well, I was at the time I was coaching and teaching, coaching swimming and teaching PE at the Buckley School in Los Angeles. Okay. And um like I said, I was a lifelong winner. So it was like, how can I be better? Right. And that, how can I push myself and be a better teacher, a better coach? Um, and maybe at some point, a better administrator. I wasn't sure what that looked like, but this program was so attractive for those reasons, right? Like I wanted to learn more about how to be a better leader and, and coaching and, and working with people. So um, I jumped right into it, not even really knowing what I was getting into. And then as I was taking the courses and and reading and learning and realizing like, wow, there's a lot more that goes into <laughs> coaching than, you know, I was aware of, right. Or teaching or, you know, being an administrator. So, um, I learned a ton through that program. And the really cool part is that being able to take all that information back and become a better teacher, right. And a better leader and a coach, um, and then putting those pieces together. So I was thrilled, um, you know, cause I, I love teaching. I love coaching. Um, and then, you know, to have those credentials behind my name, knowing that I, I'm still learning, right? And I still want to learn. Um, when I had the opportunity to, to come back on as staff, it was like, uh, how do I explain it? I was so thrilled that it was even there, right? Like, wow, I, I could actually give back to this program that taught me so much. And I think the older that I become, the more I value that human connection, right? And to be able to, to 
connect with adult learners who are really interested in learning more about how to be a better coach, a better leader. Um, it's such an honor to be able to do that and, and talk to them and figure out what they need and to serve them as well. Right. So that they can serve others. And I, I truly believe in that. And I'm so grateful and honored that they wanted me to be a part of that program on the other side. It is, it is awesome and so excited to have you a part of that uh, in teaching tomorrow's teachers and current teachers of today and coaches and leaders that are out there and making them better leaders and coaches. Um, be before we wrap things up, how's the swimming team doing right now at St. Marcus there? How are you guys doing? They're doing great. Um, I have two girls that qualified for CIF on our first meet, which was um, incredible and surprising and uh, just a testament to all of their hard work. and. Um, I have a very young team. We have a lot of freshmen, so we're kind of developing and teaching the culture. Um, we call ourselves a swamily. So we're the swim <laughs> family. And um, what's kind of neat is that they, it's a very social uh, team. You know, most of them are there because they just want to be together and they want to learn how to swim faster. Um, and we have an interesting dynamic at our school because we have such a small limited number of um, high school athletes. We have about 400 high school or high school students in general and of that population, lesser athletes. And so we have a hard time filling our teams. Right. And we try hard to, to get athletes to do multi-sports and go, you know, so our, they work hard, right. All year. Um, and so I have an interesting group of kids that some of them are incredible athletes. Like one is doing two sports, she's doing track and swim at the same time. Cause she just wants to be a part of both programs. Right. So we have like those very involved students at our school. Um, we also, I have students in the musical we're doing mama Mia and it's performing this week. And so I've had to find that balance between that, you know, that insane regimented coach that I had, you know, in high school and college. And, um, I, and it's not me, unfortunately, I could be, I love to be if, it, if necessary, but um, this team isn't that right. They are just there to enjoy each other and, and have fun and work hard. And, and I push them, right. We, I actually tease them into doing things they don't realize are hard. And <laughs> part of it is just to push their, their mental confidence in themselves. Right. Yeah. So, um, but it's, it's been a blast. I, it's, my favorite thing I do in the day uh, for work, right, is just being at the pool and, and enjoying that time with them. And the time change, it's been nice and sunny, so <laughs> they love it even more. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations on all your success. Uh, I know people enjoyed hearing more about you, your story, more about swimming, which I'm fascinated by in the Olympics. So uh, continued success. Looking forward to hearing you as one of the keynote speakers at the coaches conference coming up in June and uh, teaching classes beginning this summer. Um, just continued success. And again, thank you so much for, for sharing a little bit more about your background and, and what you're doing now. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure.